We were all under instructions to say who we were, but if I say that again now, it seems a bit <laughs> redundant. But I teach in the English faculty here in Cambridge. Um, as you've heard, in this part of today's programme, we are each asked to say why the arts and humanities matter in seven minutes. But of course, it doesn't take nearly that long. It's clear why they matter. There are a series of disciplined attempts to extend and deepen understanding of human activity in its greatest richness and diversity across times and cultures. If it is so clear, the real question may be whether there are actually people who need to have that explained to them. And if so, what's wrong with them? <laughs> in other words, I don't think we should begin by taking up a defensive posture and tone. Part of the difficulty here is that in present circumstances, any invitation to characterize the work of scholars in the humanities is almost immediately construed as an invitation to justify it. Now, it's true that all descriptions will have elements of valuation built into them, and so any characterization can be made to serve the purposes of justification. <coughs> but there's an inescapable element of defensiveness in all attempts to vindicate one's activity. It implies that the demand issues from unsympathetic premises, <coughs> and it sets up an anticipation of resistance or dismissiveness on the part of those who do not share our starting points. What it is for something to matter is not itself a straightforward matter, but it's too easily interpreted as showing that something is important because it contributes to something else that is even more important. After all, it's scarcely an exaggeration to say that the greater part of public discourse about universities at present reduces to the following dispiriting proposition. Universities need to justify getting more money, and the way to do this is by showing that they help to make more money. Since I don't want to encourage that ritualized artillery exchange of category mistakes, I should urge instead that we try, by reflecting on our own practice, to identify some of the distinguishing characteristics of good work in the humanities in its own terms. Let me offer one necessarily brief such reflection. The forms of noticing and characterizing that make up a large part of what we do require that we become as dexterous as possible in deploying and in reflecting upon our deployment of the widest possible range of overlapping vocabularies. We have to be dexterous, and the vocabulary is plural, because all writing in these fields is necessarily underdetermined by any particular theoretical model to which allegiance may be overtly given. The vocabularies we use in the humanities are, in this sense, inevitably impure. They are amalgams of idioms drawn from more than one intellectual source and from many aspects of everyday expression not explicitly derived from or grounded in any particular theory which is not, of course, to say they don't rest on or embody assumptions. To put it another way, no methodology in the humanities can furnish us with a lexicon and a syntax sufficiently extensive to replace all traces of everyday language and idiom. Even the most rebarbative, theoretically explicit jargons are shot through with and embedded in wider pre-existing vocabularies. The deftness with which this necessary embedding is carried out, the sense of grasp and proportion with which someone makes use of, rather than being made use of by, the terms of a particular approach, these are among the most telling indications of the contrast between deeper and shallower forms of understanding. And it is important, I think, to recognize that the goal of work in the humanities is better described as understanding than as knowledge, and that understanding is a human activity that depends in part on the qualities of the understander. One consequence of this is that good work in the humanities cannot, despite the pressure of bureaucratic categories, be reduced either to the exercise of skills or the discovery of new findings. Deciding whether or in what way the character of Dorothea Brooke in Middlemarch is self-deceived may be central to our understanding and estimation of that novel, but it's not a process that can be reduced to the exercise of skills. Similarly, Exploring what it might mean to say that Nietzsche's critique of morality is flawed by his not wholly ironic self-dramatization, a knotty, disputable, but perhaps profound comment on that brilliant and exasperating writer, <coughs> cannot very easily be represented as pushing back the frontiers of knowledge by means of new findings. 
So just as we should not let what we do be redescribed as a bizarrely roundabout way of increasing the gross domestic product, so we should not let it be redescribed in terms drawn from an industrial model of research. The kinds of understanding and judgment exercised in the humanities are of a piece with the kinds of understanding and judgment involved in living a life. We should recognise that that, in the end, is why they interest us and seem worth doing, and perhaps we then need to acknowledge that any subsequent attempts at justification in other terms must start from and build on that recognition. In trying to justify the humanities, as in trying to live a life, what may matter most is holding one's nerve. Thank you.